Hello, I'm Al Sanchez, President of AMARC Enterprises and Poly MBA. Do you have a health challenge? Does maybe a loved one, a friend, a family member? Does cancer have a concern for you in your life? If, it, if you do, we've developed a webinar that might be interesting to you. It answers a lot of questions, it helps with some information, some guidance on health, lifestyle, as well as how Poly MBA can fit in. Hello and thank you for taking the time to listen to this webinar. My name is Al Sanchez. I am the president of AMARC Enterprises, the primary distributor of Poly MVA. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to you and share my knowledge and experience on Poly MVA, as well as you know what it might be able to do and what it's done and, and hopefully it'll give you some insight into uh, the Poly, as we like to call it, as well as um, how it fits into our overall health program, as well as our whole mission of what we're trying to do here. Um, this first slide I put up because it really helps to remind me that we know so very little. Um, you know, we love to come up with things and we have technology and we have lots of pharmaceuticals and, and, and many things in our world today that have done wonderful things, but yet we're still losing uh, the overall health battle in my opinion. Uh, more people are dying of cancer, heart disease, more children and people are, are, are growing with diabetes. We have uh, MS, Alzheimer's, dementia, various types of things that are really impacting our society these days. We kind of lump those together in something that we call degenerative diseases. And it, it's interesting, in, in, in modern medicine, if we'd like to call it that, to a certain degree, doesn't have the answers. They're searching, they're talking about research, they're talking about this. Um, but they really haven't um, been able to put their finger on it. They understand that there's a disruption in our cells, that there's a disruption in our body. Um, we want to talk about it in gene theory and proteomics and all these various things, but ultimately they don't know. And that's okay. It's okay not to know. But I think it's, it, again, it's, it's an important reminder to myself and I like to share that with others is that <clears throat> to get these solutions that we're looking for for these types of situations, we need to think a little bigger, a little broader, and a little more collectively. So, this slide also reminds me as well is that not just the physicality of what we're trying to do, that we can, you know, take our vitamins, minerals, and, and, and get our exercise, um, those things are very important. But we are a complete creature. We have um, a very spiritual, uh, our soul side um, that plays a huge role in our health. Um, I have seen people do nothing except change maybe their environment, their physical environment from some situation where there was a lot of negativity, uh, quote unquote, a lot of negative energy we'll call it. Um, it impacted their health so much that it actually um, accelerated the body's um, disease state and if you change that environment then it makes perfect sense that guess what your body's going to respond in kind so this helps to remind me again that when we live in the present when we let go of things that may have um, be dragging us down emotionally from um, maybe some family maybe some you know a lost or a loved one that um, and, 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 you, and, you, and you live where you're at today it, it really makes a difference in your life so now I'd like to get into what we like to call lipoic acid palladium complex. Um, you know, this picture that you're seeing is, is very specific to what uh, Poly MBA is about, what uh, the manufacturer and the inventor, Dr. Merrill Garnett, is about. Um, his, his young daughter at the time, who's now much older, uh, drew that picture when, after Dr. Garnett, after she became very attached to the mice and his research, and when they stopped dying, he would set them free he knew that he had landed on, on what he was looking for. So, do no harm is not only his model and his belief, but ours as well. If you're in any way, shape, or form harming the body, then it's going to impact the overall health, of course. And a lot of current treatments and protocols have quote-unquote side effects that I'm sure most of us have heard about, read about, understand, and not sure exactly as to why that is what is allowed to be or accepted to be the paradigm, especially in what's dear to my heart, and that's cancer care. 
where these treatments are many times worse than the disease itself. And I really struggle with uh, their approach as to how and why they can honestly offer these treatments that they do knowing that, or maybe not knowing, maybe they didn't do enough research in them to realize it and they wouldn't, but they're kind of caught up into a, a bigger um, approach into what they're trying to do and, and they don't realize it. And when they do, of course, they stop, but we gotta get, we gotta get ahead of that curve. We gotta be able to um, explain to those that are, that are afflicted by um, these degenerative type diseases that there are other options. Um, and that's why we call it an integrative and complementary approach. Um, I've seen too many times where these things work better together than they do by themselves. Uh, the term we like to talk about in today's day and age is, is synergy. So, you know, we, we talked about degenerative diseases and, and what their causes might be. Changes, you know, our lifestyle, um, how that impacts it. We know it does, but at what level? Um, and this really gets into, you know, we hear a lot of things about gene therapy. Well, what is gene therapy? Can you really go and repair your genes? You know, why, why is your body breaking down um, at an earlier rate in certain situations rather than later? Um, most of these diseases, we used to think of them as, as quote unquote, old people disease. It's just, it's just what's going to happen when you get old. Well, guess what? Yes, to a certain degree, we are going to age. Our body's not going to be able to repair itself as quickly, but that shouldn't mean that the rates of diseases that we have today are higher when you adjust them for age. So age-adjusted diseases means that we're having more disease even though we're getting older and people are living longer. So people say, well, you're going to see more disease when you live old, uh, the older that people get. Well, to a certain degree, yes, but when you adjust it for age, that's not true. Um, more and more people are being diagnosed with things like cancer. More and more people are are suffering from diabetes, more people are suffering from these degenerative situations um, at early and earlier ages in their lives than ever before. So what's going on here? Um, what's in our lifestyle that may be affecting that? And what's up with our cells to a certain degree? You know, we, we talk about cell death as I have up here on the slide. You know, what is it? How is it pre-programmed? What's, what's going on? If, it, if it's in our genes, then we're kind of just, that's the way it is. Well. We know that's not true. We know that there's things that can be influential on that. And the things that we talked about earlier, diet, lifestyle, those types of things, greatly impact how those genes express themselves. And what I mean by that is that um, the chemicals in our environment directly impact our bodies very powerfully. I put up this slide very specifically. I was on a, a trip to go to pick up some food for my son's Boy Scouts and they wanted to go over to Kentucky Fried Chicken and gave me a list and I just went over there and I'm standing in line not thinking much about it because of course the running late and gotta get some food and the kids are hungry and I reached down and I pick up one of their brochures that they had on the counter. I'm reading it and going I took it over on the back side and of course the warning label you know strikes me and I look at it and I'm like wow well, and, and I know in general that fried foods themselves um, are not as healthy as let's say raw or fresh cooked or, or grilled or those types of things. But um, this one just struck me as odd and I said, wow, I gotta be able to share this with other people. And, you know, and it talks about the, the chemical, um, acrylamide, and that in the state of California, it's on the list as a cancer causing agent. And yet, um, you know, how much is done the way that KFC does that, the way how much acrylamide is created when is that temperature related? Is that the type of oils that's used? Um, or is it, is it just something for them? I, I don't know, but I was literally astounded. And uh, you know, I turned around and walked out and said, uh, I'm gonna go over to, uh, I think it was El Pollo Loco at the time, <laughs> and get some uh, grilled chicken there versus the fried chicken. So um, I was disappointed because you know, as a kid, I grew up with, with Kentucky Fried Chicken. I didn't know any better. Um, and was it going on then? Did I get exposed to this stuff when I was a kid? Does it does it come out of the, you know, anyways, my mind just started running on all these things, but it was just fascinating as a great example that we're all living our lives in our modern world, and we may, be, we may just be killing ourselves literally, and or injuring ourselves greatly. So, and, and to put that into perspective, when you look at the worldwide burden of cancer, um, and that's what this slide really addresses, it's just astounding, these numbers, they're almost 
unrealistic at a certain limit. I mean, 11 million new cases. Now granted, out of a world of 7 billion people, that may not seem like that big of a number, but it is in retrospect to what, if you go back 100 years and you look at the cancer rates then, um, now granted they weren't as easily diagnosed or tracked as they are today, so even given, you know, that we're, we're able to see a lot more and track a lot more, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that's the only justification because we know even in the short term of the past 40 years, cancer rates continue to go up. So it, it's these type of things that really need to be raised to the level of, of attention that, you know, something's going on. And in any other situation, it would almost be pandemic to think that, you know, we're in 2013 now and that by 2020, you're going to have 15 million new cases. Um, that's just just huge. And granted, even with an aging population, um, you know, we think about it in the Western world, I don't know that many people that smoke like they used to here in, in, in the U.S., but you go outside the U.S. Um, and the tobacco companies have really just exploited the the uh, third world countries and these up and coming countries with tobacco and uh, it's unfortunate so whatever we can do to help in those in those areas and you, and you look at the rates of, of new cases and deaths you know by 2030 um, those are astounding projections on incidences of cancer um, and what do we have to address it why sets the rise um, and the main thing in my opinion would be uh, lifestyles, chemicals, pollution, um, these things are, are very powerful agents and damage and, and have hard effects on our, on our body and our, and our cell DNA. And when that gets altered or changed, then abnormal cells like cancer now have a better environment in which they can um, grow and, and take hold. You, you look at in the U.S. alone, so you have the disease, heart disease versus um, cancer, um, somewhat neck and neck. Yet, however, if you took the deaths of cancer due to the treatments of it, then cancer would have been um, the number one death a long time ago. So, and what I mean by that is, for example, if someone has lung cancer um, and then they contact COPD because of all the treatments, the fact that they've removed part of their lung, um, the fact that uh, now they get pneumonia and they die of pneumonia, well, guess what? They go down as, as, as a death over there on the right-hand column of, of pneumonia, and they lower the, the one from cancer. But ultimately, it was cancer that took their life, um, and the side effect was pneumonia. But from classificational purposes, of course, they don't want that to look good, because if you, if you did that, that number would actually be staggering and would really um, impact people on a, on a greater level, in my opinion. So what is cancer? I mean, really, it's it kind of seems like this little enigma that that people don't really uh, they know it's it's bad. They know it's not good. But you know, I really have had to ask myself so I could I could understand it. It could it could really make sense of it for myself. And when I was looking at it, you know, this was a great picture. I, I'm a picture guy. Pictures help. You know, a picture speaks a thousand words. It makes sense. Okay, I see. So you had the, the healthy cell and it splits and then one was good and it goes along its merry way, but the other one didn't. The other one didn't um, replicate correctly. For what reason? Why? There could be hundreds, maybe thousands of different reasons. Um, but unfortunately, it was allowed to hang out. The, the body didn't take care of it. And then some years later, um, we now have a tumor. Or we have an increase in the tumor marker. Um, and so by its definition, it's just it's cells that are growing out of control. Well, okay, out of control to a certain degree, meaning that it just keeps replicating and replicating. And the key word here is that it doesn't have any what's known as differentiation. And what I mean by differentiation is that, for example, and this is where I kind of put two and two together in my mind. So when we were conceived, we were a single cell organism. So mom and dad came together and made a single cell organism. And then that cell split. Now think about the picture here. And then that cell split again and divided. Mitosis is what they call it. And you had two cells, and you had four cells, and you had eight, and you had 16, and you had 32, and on and on and on, do the math. And then at some point in time, because of the way the DNA is, is scripted, those cells then be, started to become something. They became differentiated versus undifferentiated cells. Now those cells came and they became our organs, they became our skin, they became our hair, our eyes, 
our structure. Um, well, guess what? These cancer cells are pretty much just those same cells at a certain level, just stuck in the replication mode. They forgot what to do. So they're not like taking over our body because of you know, invading our cells and, and converting these other, our good cells to be bad cells. Nope, they can just replicate at a faster rate because they're uncontrolled um, than our normal cells. They, and they have, no pro they have no purpose. They're not going to do any job that's gonna help the body. What they do is they start to push out the healthy cells that are doing the job. If it's a liver cancer, if it's a, a pancreatic cancer, a stomach cancer, they start taking over where now you don't have any stomach cells. Well, then guess what? That's not going to be very good. You don't have more liver cells. Well, that's not going to be very good. So, or they break off and they travel somewhere else and they start pushing out the other cells. And that's what they call metastasis. Well, I think you're getting the picture. And so what is this on off switch? Is there something that, that triggered that one cell down there? In, in the picture to say, oh, I'm not going to be differentiated. What was that? Well, was it, as, was it some nuclear radiation? Was it just some chemical like acrylamide? Was it a carcinogen like mercury? Was it lead? Which one was it? Who knows exactly? But the point being is that our bodies have different mechanisms for taking care of that, and that's what I believe we need to really focus on and target in an integrative type approach. So we, some of you may have heard this term, it's called oncogenesis. And what, and, this is kind of breaking down cancer. What I'm trying to do is, is, is give you a big high level view of, of, of this and then we're going to come down and we're going to really focus in on, on, on the point of where I'm after and how um, lipoic acid palladium complex as well as lifestyle, diet, nutrition really, really play an issue with that. So in oncogenesis or the beginning of cancer, um, you have initiation, then you have promotion, then you have progression. Okay, so let's go through those. Initiation, something initiates cancer. Okay, well so, I, I like common sense, and I think it goes a long way. Well, we have approximately, in an adult human body, 70 trillion cells. 70 trillion, yes, that's a large number, something that none of us can, can truly uh, comprehend. Of those, they're replicating every day, each and every one of them, from our head down to our toe, and our organs and our skin, some faster, some slower, depending on what's happening, but they're replicating. Well, guess what, do they all replicate perfectly? No, they don't. And when they do not replicate properly, they are technically an abnormal cell at that point in time. Okay, great. Yet, our DNA and our body and our immune system are all programmed to handle this. This has been a lifelong thing. It's part of all organisms in the world. And then they get taken care of, they get removed out of the body, and the body keeps right on going. But what happens when all of a sudden you get cancer in say your pancreas so the pancreatic cell didn't replicate right and all of a sudden it's now going to continue with uncontrolled growth and it could have been because of some chemical maybe it's because of um, something that something that impacted the cell okay but why does it stay there and yet everywhere else in the body it was fine all the other organs at that point in time the immune system was able to target it but what was missing at that location of that initiation in, in, in the pancreas? And then all of a sudden, now the initiation started, and now that cancer cell gets to hang around, and now it starts to promote itself. Now it starts to really want to take hold. So almost think of it like I like to use the analogy of, of a weed in your garden, right? The weed landed, and all of a sudden it sprouts, and if left unattended, what's going to happen to it? It has the ability to take over your entire garden. It can replicate faster. It can drop more seeds than the other plants in your garden and before you know it it's all covered in, in weeds well kind of similar to, to cancer and this is where things that and you'll see them there on that slide things like inflammation um, differentiation the biochemical changes of the environment for example and what I mean by that is that cancer cells love acidic environments well guess what if your diet and lifestyle is contributing to maintaining a more acidic environment in your body and then this pancreatic cell that just was replicating, one of them goes bad, and it now lands itself in an environment that is more conducive to the weed growing than the healthy plant growing, what do you think is gonna happen? Now it's promoting its growth. So this is where this process really starts to get um, interesting or sticky as I like to call it, because this is where we can really target these types of things. We can affect 
inflammation. We can affect biochemical changes in our body, and we'll get to that in a little bit. And then you have progression. So if, le if left unattended, the tumor grows and grows and grows. You don't know about it, everything's feeling fine. And then all of a sudden one day you've just got a cough that you just can't get rid of, you got a pain in your side, you go get checked out. Before you know it, you have a stage four tumor, it's metastatic to your lungs and your brain. But what do you do? At that point in time, it's, 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 it's bottom of the knife now. What do you do? And, the, and that's where it's tough because cancer only becomes detectable typically once it gets in the progression not at the promotion or the initiation. So, now the neo, neoplasia, or where the tumor begins at, is typically how, how they classify the cancers. So, and what I mean by that is that if, that if you get, um, if those cells happen to be in your pancreas initially, then the initial form of cancer that you had was pancreatic. If it was liver, it's liver cancer, stomach, it's stomach cancer, etc., etc. So, but what's interesting is that these cancer cells, um, and what this slide is really addressing is the fact that they're clever little buggers. Um, you know, they change. They're very adaptable to their situation. Let's go back to that analogy that I talked about about the weeds in your garden, right? You pull the one weed, oh, it has another shoot on the other side. It takes off and comes out somewhere else. Its ability to, to maintain and hang around is, is very unique. That's the way they are kind of designed to rapidly grow and do so. I mean, I'm sure most of us have understand the weed concept. Right? Go and try and take the weeds out of your garden, but go take the one plant that you really like. Grab that rose bush or, or whichever plant you, <laughs> you like, grab it, cut it off at the roots, pull out the root ball. Do you think another one's gonna grow there? Not likely, right? But that weed, it's designed for that. And that's the hard part about it. They are designed to be um, to stick around. They're designed to survive. They are kind of like the first type of cell. They are designed almost similarly, too similar in my opinion, to those initial cells when we were conceived that their job was just to replicate and that's it. So they can funnel in all their efforts and all their energy by just saying, you know what, I don't need to go and do any work. I just need to replicate and replicate and replicate and replicate. That's why they become so, so difficult to get rid of. We, we talked about this a little earlier the causes of cancer. Well, there are many. Um, some of the big ones that I think that we can affect, <coughs> of course, is there are some genetic dispositions to it. That's just, that's just in our genes and there's nothing necessarily that we can do about that. Um, but what we can do things about are the toxins, are the bugs, and or what we call biological factors that are going to impact how our genes express themselves. And we'll get to that a little bit later. So, here's a good list of various causes of cancer. Um, and again, one of these by themselves <clears throat> may not be enough, but you start taking many of these things and you put them all into, a, into the recipe, into the bowl of your life, into your health, and wow, what do you think you're gonna get out of it? It's not likely gonna be good. So, you know, we could all cite individual cases out of this. Well, I've had people who've been on nuclear radiation and they're just fine, okay. I've had people that work in pesticides all their life. Okay, I know people that drink fluoridated water and they're just fine. And tobacco, you can go through each one of these, but that's not my point. My point of what I'm trying to say is that all these things are around us in one shape or form. Some of us get exposed to, to more than others. Um, the thing that makes me think about this is what you may have heard in the news or looked to the herd reports about when they call them cancer clusters. Why all of a sudden in this one area is there a cluster of this type of cancer? You have childhood cancers in certain cities or certain places or certain, they got exposed to something. There's, nobody will disagree with you with that. Just at the rate of it though, they don't know. So, and that's almost, that, that's hard to, to, to pinpoint. But the point being is, we have control over putting ourselves around these types of things. So, let's start at the top one. Do we have our opportunity to pull ourselves out of, out of food that is bit irradiated? Yes, we do. Additives, sure we do. If we have mercury toxicity that we're gonna put inside of our, of our teeth for our fillings, of course we can. How much sunlight we get, how much EMF are we exposed to? That's a big one these days, and there's a lot of science and research going on around that. We know that electromagnetic fields affect cells. Plant cells, animal cells, our cells. How much? Well, we know that under the big power lines, you don't build houses there. Okay, but nowadays we're all carrying around cell phones. Is that enough to cause an impact? I don't know. Is the Wi-Fi in your house too much? I don't know. I mean, technically we're getting bombarded by EMF now at a level that is almost kind of scary. 
everybody, every house has got one. So your neighbor's admitting it, you're admitting it, um, you're carrying around with it. Is that enough to, to cause damage to the cells? I don't know exactly. Some will say yes, some will say no. But you know what? Yes, I carry a cell phone around. But then at night, I don't keep it next to my bed. You know, at night, I, I put my, my uh, Wi-Fi system on a, I just used a Christmas light timer. It goes off at, at 10 o'clock and it comes back on at six in the morning. Okay, or eight in the morning, whatever time you want to set it for. Or you manually turn it on and off, whatever works for you. But there have been studies on certain people and it creates activity in your brain. Okay, well, probably not a good thing. So I can limit that, okay? So, and this is my point. Do they take active effort? They sure do. But is it worth it in my opinion? In my opinion it is. I lost my mom and my sister to cancer as well as, well as a lot of other family and friends. So if I can help them minimize that, that's what I'm trying to do here. Again, we talk about bugs and bacteria, certain molds and, and, and parasites and viruses um, break the cells down and make them more susceptible to cancer. Okay. So again, it's talking about this recipe. This is this is a recipe for for not just cancer, but it's actually and I should probably change that slide. Um, this is a recipe for degenerative disease. It really is. Um, it breaks down our body. It hurts our our immune system. It, it holds back our DNA from being able to properly operate, um, and it has a huge impact. Um, some of the biological factors we've already talked about. Um, all these things again create a recipe for degenerative disease, for ill health, you know. Look at the bottom one for vaccines. And you hear people, oh, vaccines this, oh, vaccines that. No, maybe by themselves, when they test them just as a sole agent, you're right, maybe they're fine. But you take that vaccine and you put it into someone who has a compromised system, and what happens? <laughs> yeah. And that's my point. And it's almost impossible to test all the variations of this. So just because the research community or the company that's wanting, of course, wanting to sell the vaccine or what have you says, we tested it, it was safe. Really? And I'd like to give you a quick example of that. So my oldest son is 12 years old. He went in for a physical, he was going to a Boy Scout camp last summer. And so I took him down there, okay, to get him signed off on his physical, because it's required. And the uh, doctor looks at me and says, okay, well, we want to, uh, you know, he's eligible for uh, his vaccine. I said, excuse me? No more vaccines. He's 12. He's done. Well, they've just approved uh, the Gardasil vaccine. The Gardasil? You mean the one for women and, and cervical cancer? Yeah, that one. What do you mean they approved it for, for, for young boys? He's 12 years old. <laughs> well, they say it's safe. <laughs> Let me tell you, I lit that doctor up. They say it's safe. Oh my God. I, couldn't, I, sat, I think I said it to her like four times. And every time I said it a little bit louder. They say it's safe? Hmm, who is they? <laughs> right, that was my first question. Who is they? Oh, the company that's selling it, really? So let me get this straight here. The company that's selling the vaccine says it's safe, and I want to believe them, why? So let's, let's go here, did you review it? No. Did you go look at the, the literature? No. Did you ask what they ever, have they ever tested that against a 12 year old boy and his um, state of, of, of maturity and how that's going to impact him over the long haul. No. And you're asking me as, as his parent to give it to him because they say it's safe. Oh my God, I, I, was, I was beside myself. You know, we expect these doctors, we expect these people, and it, it's an expectation that, that I've had to realign. You know, they're under their own situation that is difficult for them. They're trying to do their own business, they have their own families and things like that. But when it comes to the health of myself and or my child, no, that responsibility clearly lies on my shoulders. Um, and the little things like that can have huge impacts. So, anyways, I don't want to get sidetracked on that, but it's just, that, that's a small example of how these types of things all come together to, to make up our health. You know, would he be fine with it? Maybe. Would he not be fine with it? Would I, do I want to take that chance? Not in today's day and age anymore. Uh -uh. Not with everything going on and what's in the environment. Um, you know, we talked about toxins earlier. Um, the exact number is still up in the air, but after, from 1950 to right now, uh, they say anywhere between 75 and 100,000 new chemicals are on the face of the planet that have never existed before. Really? <laughs> so you, you look around your house, the plastics, 
um, the cleaners, um, all these things by themselves tested, the shampoos, the lotions, all these things by themselves, they tested them. Oh, we did some animal testing on some, on some rats and it didn't irritate their skin. Okay, well, and there's no possible way they could ever test those things with all the various combinations that exist in one person's life. Well, I've come to the point where it's like, no, remove them, period. So why would I want to even be in that environment? You know, and so I have air fresheners in, 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 in the children's rooms and giving them the, the, the environment that is, that, is, that is best for them. You know, clean water, clean air, um, as free from chemicals as possible because I don't want any of that initiation going on. And here's a nice little picture like I talked about earlier that just really kind of gives a good uh, visual on cancer. Um, and the one that I pulled out on that is, is the inflammation. Um, at the micro environment and what I mean by that is at the cellular level so um, all these other things are just processes of it but we know that inflammation plays a key role and we're gonna get into that here shortly what is inflammation well here's kind of a nice little scientific chart and what it ultimately leads to is a condition or a, or a thing that they call NF NF kappa B and we know that that really triggers and irritates cells at the cellular level. And when that gets created by things like inflammation, infection, carcinogens, the cytokines, as these things become more irritating, cells typically will initiate cancer faster. So what I mean by that is, for example, take your, say you have a scratch on the back of your hand, take your nail and start scratching it. Ah, oh, feels good, yeah, nice little scratch. Okay, now keep scratching it. <laughs> and keep scratching it, and scratching it, and scratching it. Now we have inflammation. Well, okay, now, so now the skin's turning red, it's getting inflamed, but you keep scratching it. Ultimately, what's gonna happen? You're gonna wear the skin away, you're gonna expose the tissue. Now, analogy-wise, cancer cells, and that's how inflammation continues to irritate our cells, our particular organ, maybe it's uh, the liver, maybe it's the pancreas, maybe it's the, the kidneys, constantly being irritated by something, who knows, or a combination thereof. And what's going to happen? We know from the research that this in turn causes more tumorogenesis. So that constant irritation at the cellular level allows, um, over the long haul, abnormal cells to take hold. Okay, makes sense. Science supports it, the research out there supports it, and we know inflammation is, is, is a key to many things these days. The research and the literature out there is, is just astounding if you really look at it. So, um, and over the long haul, what's it gonna get us? You know, they're, they're, they're the proliferation. They're, they're in where we can't necessarily, we know the cells are going to become not divide correctly. It's going to happen. Nothing's perfect, but the body has systems built in to take care of that. But then all of a sudden, we don't have the systems in place, or we've suppressed those systems. Now what happens? Over the long haul, that ongoing inflammation, and now we have a degenerative disease, and or worst case scenario, we have a cancer. So we've talked about this in a little bit. Again, another picture to help really paint that for you and take a look at it. And you know, one of those things by themselves, hmm, not necessarily. But you take all those and you roll those up into one ball inside of our body and are we really surprised at those earlier statistics of cancer? I'm not anymore. It makes perfect sense. It really does. It's, it's, it's kind of simple. Um, so then, and it, now it gives us a roadmap of what to follow. What can we do? How can we look at that? Um, this is a, a, a great slide from the point of view that just, it, it really brings home the fact that says, okay, smoker, yeah, inflammation is your bronchitis, cancers, mm -hmm, they have a higher rate. Why? They're always irritating and inflaming their bronchial tubes. Okay, hepatitis, okay, those do have, hepa they're irritating the liver. What happens? Liver cancers. Um, bacteria that sit there and irritate in a very particular one, um, the GBS will target the gallbladder. Okay, and so it's it's 
it, it, it makes perfect sense now. Now I get the connections. Now the, the, the roadmap has been built to a certain degree, and I see why asbestos and mesothelioma, and it's targeting those cells. That's where that one targets. And in, in these different carcinogens, target those cells. Um, you know, irritable, irritable bounce syndrome. Well, guess what? Higher incidence of colon cancer, and on and on and on. So, and then once that happens, what are your choices? Hmm, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. Wow, that's it, huh? Okay. Well, how successful have those been? No, not very successful. They haven't changed. Well, there have been new ones for the past 40 years, but the approach is the same. Now, a lot of people call that, you know, cut, poison, and burn. And to a certain degree, that's exactly what they do. Um, those fast-growing cells are more susceptible to that. So are the other fast-growing cells of our body. And if we don't protect and support those, we get usually a, a double whammy. So how can, how can, how can we build, quote-unquote, a better mousetrap? Um, and these chronic diseases, again, caused by chronic inflammation. And what do they require? A chronic treatment. So how can we suppress that? How can we support the body? How can we now target these things to upregulate what our body is phenomenally wonderful at? And that is taking care of ourselves, repairing ourselves. Um, if we give it the ingredients to support those natural mechanisms, then lo and behold, healthy body. And I wish it was as simple as this, and it is to a very simple degree. So again, let's give credit to Hippocratic, that Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Now I understand why. Because like my grandmother told me, you are what you eat <laughs> and put into your body and live around and emotionally take on. <laughs> so she needed to fulfill, or fill that out for me, but I, I, get, the, I get the message now. Um, and it directly impacts our health in, in a way that I never truly understood. And what can we do with that? Okay, pretty much simple. There it is. My picture's worth a thousand words. Keep those things as the majority of our diet and intake with a lot of clean water, some fresh air, a little exercise. Wow, goes a long way for anti-inflammatory, healthy amino acids, enzymes, vitamins, minerals, um, there it is, right there. Do those as much as you can each and every day at part of your meals. And wow, you just took out a, a big, a big, a big factor in the degenerative disease slash inflammation slash um, health situation. <sighs> Obesity and cancer. Um, it, it's self-evident um, for men and women. The, the higher the rates. The higher the, the higher the higher the weight, the higher the rate is is, is, is what it says, um, and it's self-evident. So from all the various types of, of cancer across the board. So if you could target your any smoking, you could target the chemicals, and you could target the food, you eliminate almost two thirds of all cancers. Two thirds of those 11 million cases of cancer. Wow, that, that's impactful. Um, you know, colon cancer and red meat. So, and it's not so much the red meat as it is by the processed. They've been processed. You know, the more unnatural the food becomes, quote unquote, the more processed it has to run through, the less and less nutritional value it has. Um, the chemicals that get put into it, the chemicals that get created because of the process is the main message of this. So I'm not just saying simply red meat across the board, but it has a higher incidence of it. Um, it's tougher on the system, it's tougher on the body. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy it and or do it, do it healthy wise, but um, the process stuff is, 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 is the key takeaway from this for what it's gone through to, well, by the time it gets to you, it's no longer that nice processed meat. For anyone else that has, that's had fresh, fresh meat, it, it, you can know there's, there's a big difference in, in the taste, flavor, and its, and its nutritional value. Interestingly enough though, for 43% of the patients that have colitis, develop what? Cancer. That constant inflammation in the colon creating the issues. So um, a balanced approach with food, dietary supplements, 
and of course good fiber help the colon tremendously. Um, we talk about vitamin E. Um, vitamin E has been, it was big back in the 70s and it kind of, it, it comes and goes, but it's still one of the good standards for being anti-inflammatory. Very, very healthy, um, but again, not just one version and the best location to get that is in combination with mostly with your food along with um, any supplementation that you might need depending upon your specific situation. And what I mean by that is that we're all different. So uh, a, a five-year-old versus a 20-year-old versus a 30-year-old, a 50 and a 60 and a 70-year-old are going to need different requirements for different things. Let alone if it's female, male, and, and what stage in life. So, but vitamin E is, is one of my top favorites. Good sources for this. So you don't just have to necessarily get that from your from the bottle. Where would you rather get it from? The food. Because there you're getting it along with other things. That's the great thing about it. These things just aren't sold by themselves. And if you need to, that's where supplements, and that's why dietary supplements are nice to have and are almost necessary because our bodies are getting so bombarded with all the bad stuff these days that it now gives the opportunity to work in combination. It works together. The food works together. So you take all these healthy foods and you mix them together in your meals and that's what gives your body. Now your body has the resources to um, do what it needs to do and that is repair, take, take care of and be healthy. That's what our body is trying to always maintain is that homeostasis. Um, you know it's interesting I, I put this on there the fact that a lot of um, new drugs that are coming out on the market um, are now versions of the plants. They're trying to find these things. Uh, tamoxifen is, is a fine example of, of the drug. I mean, aspirin is even a variation of the tree bark. Um, but it does two things. One, it's hopefully bringing these pharmaceutical agents into, into, into the light and into the arena that says, we don't need to create a synthetic. We don't need to create something that the body's not going to recognize and likely become toxic. Why don't we go with what nature does? Nature has is a wonderful example of all the things to do right. Um, modern medicine and modern uh, pharmaceuticals in a certain degree are what not to do when you see what Vioxx and some of these chemotherapies and, um, are about. I mean, I, I still remember when I found out that one of the first chemotherapeutic agents ever made was out of World War I from the mustard gas. Really? That's what they found that suppressed, you know, it ravaged the patient as well, but hey, it kept him alive a little longer and it put the cancer at bay, so that's where chemotherapies almost truly got their start, was in mustard gas from World War I. Wow, and that's how far we've come, and yet we still make these toxic um, chemotherapies. And fortunately, they're getting a little bit more localized and understanding the dosages nowadays than they were before, but Boy, there was a time there where it was just, it, it, it was ugly and not very nice to the patients and, and ethical in my opinion. Resveratrol, a lot of you may have heard of resveratrol, it's been kind of in the news, but wonderful anti-inflammatory, very natural, and where do you find it? Wow, lo and behold, in our foods, how wonderful is that? So these, these, these unique chemical compounds that are in foods, um, you know, hopefully maybe that's where the scientific community can now start to extract that maybe a little more specifically to create much more, um, heaven forbid say it, natural treatments that won't be so hard on the body and can support a very specific condition um, like some of the drugs do now so that it's more helpful and, and supportive to our body. Um, here's just a list of, of a lot of things that resveratrol is, can be shown to do. Uh, a lot of the research out there on resveratrol, so it, it's, it's one of my my favorite supplements as well. Fish oils. I uh, can't speak enough about fish oils. Um, oils like the vitamin E as well as the omega 369s, I'm mean, the omega 3s and 6s. Um, you know, they're, they're the final carrier in the cell cycle for creating energy. Very key. Without that, nothing happens in the cell. So, it makes sense that if, if for some reason you're not able to um, get that into your diet, some of those are a little tougher with, with some of the fish, great. And that's where nutraceuticals really fill a nice void to help support the body in, in all the things that it needs. And tons of research out there, great support 
Um, and again, one of my one of my favorites that I definitely want to share with people. Curcumin, another one. Numbers of studies. Um, it's being used across the board, and yet you can find it in your food. Um, and there's supplementation out there as well. So one I've really been keeping my eye on for uh, how this can really help in these degenerative diseases and for the patients themselves. Enzymes, can't speak enough about enzymes. Um, our bodies need enzymatic reactions to put these things together, the vitamins, the minerals, um, the proteins, the fats, the carbohydrates, all these things need to be synthesized. How does that happen? They don't work by themselves. They need energy from the cell and they need enzymes to help that process and the carriers to get these through. Where do those enzymes come? Guess what? From natural foods. And the more you process, the more you heat, cook, guess what you damage? All the enzymes in the food. So a lot of you may have heard out there that you have um, dead food. That's what they're referring to. The food is dead because the enzymes have been removed from it. Oh great, so you have calcium in there, okay. Calcium doesn't work very well without magnesium. It doesn't work well without vitamin D. It doesn't work well without the enzymes to put those two together. So you can get now, technically, you can have calcium poison because you take all this calcium, but your body can't use it because it doesn't have any enzymes. All right, what do we do? Well, that's where the enzymes from our food come in and play a key role. This slide really brings home the fact that, um, you know, if what we're targeting is to, is how our bodies are expressing and our genes are controlling the mechanisms of our cells and our organs, um, it's not just one. You know, we hear about that in the news and I kind of just, it's, it, makes me just go, really? What are these guys doing? And why? why what, the, the P53 gene, that's, that's just the bad thing? You think the P53 gene just works by itself? None of the other genes work with it? No. For some reason, the P53 gene is now expressing itself more than the rest of them. Why? Okay, well, there's a big, there's a longer chain going on here. And it just didn't happen one day that the P53 gene decided to go off by itself and say, gee, I'm gonna go and go crazy and become that, the initiation of this cancer cell because of the, I have the bad gene. We all have bad genes technically. What expresses those genes? That's what I'm more concerned about. And, you know, we dial that down. We don't turn it off. We dial down these expressions so that these genes don't necessarily be out of control. They're in balance and they're working with the system. Why did the P53 gene decide to express itself? That's what I'm more concerned about, like I said. And how can we do that? Well, guess what? These anti-inflammatories, these foods, these things help to naturally control what that process is in our bodies. So how do we get this change in a paradigm? How do we help to look at it differently? Because we have to. If we don't, um, I don't believe the rates of cancer, the rates of degenerative disease are going to improve at all. Um, we have to be able to open ourselves up to um, a broader view of how we're going to approach um, health and well-being. And that is going to require, like we talked about earlier, a much more natural products that our bodies can recognize and utilize versus these, you know, simple drugs. Okay, great. They, you know, for a very specific event, they're great. You, know, you have a heart condition, your your blood pressure is just running off the charts. Yeah, you know what? There's no supplementation in the world that's ever going to bring that down immediately because that's critical mass. Okay, take a specific drug, it brings it down, it gets it under control, gets you some time, and now you can start changing the diet and lifestyle so that your body can do it naturally. Your body doesn't want to run high blood pressure normally, it doesn't want to run at a high heart rate normally, but it's doing so in response to the diet and lifestyle that we technically are living. If you change that, then what's going to change? Change your lifestyle, it will change your life. The two go hand in hand. Uh, we talk about insulin potentiated therapies. So the insulin potentiated therapies are available for, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique approach in which uh, the doctors now have the ability to look at how insulin is, is, is a really key factor in what our cells do and when they do it. And if they can use this therapy to then have a much more targeted approach not only for cancer patients, because cancer cells are very sugar dependent, that's why this is so unique in it, but it wasn't initially found out of that. It was, it's helps to target therapies across the board. So, 
working with uh, various organizations that, specif that uh, specialize in IPT and how that can be much more effective and safe for cancer patients is what key. Um, there's a great organization out there that, that teaches doctors and is supported by the Best Answer for Cancer Foundation. It's a really good group of doctors. They really get together, they, they try and, and handle the solution collectively, not just independently, which is phenomenal in this industry these days. How do you know if you have cancer? Well, by the one definition that we talked about earlier, we all have cancer. But where do we have cancer that it becomes, quote unquote, the problem? Well, here's some various ways that we go through that and look at the various profiles um, and testing that we can look and say, okay, is something going on in that situation and at what stage is it at so that we know how we can approach it. What I would like to do is just not even have to get to this point, but if we do, it's nice to know that we have options like IPT and other various therapies for, um, for the patients. Again, some more information on cancer, what you might look at, MRIs, biopsies, um, these types of things. You know, and, and some of the tests as well are, um, are they safe? Do we want to be having these things and getting exposing ourselves to radiation? And if we do, should we be protecting ourselves before we go and have them? Those are difficult questions, and the answer, in my opinion, is yes. Why wouldn't we do something? You know, if you're going to go in for an x-ray, you're going to go in for a CT scan, an MRI, yeah, take things that are going to protect you from, from, from radiation exposure. And then you can go off them if that's all you were going to do. Or if you want to stay on them because of the lingering effects, that's great. Not a problem. And a lot of foods can do that as well. See reactive protein and, of course, the power Doppler sonography for breast cancer and prostate cancer. Um, you know, let's start with the simple stuff. Let's not do these big invasive treatments, these big exposures to these patients that are already compromised. Let's do it a lot smarter, not harder. You know, we talked earlier on about that mind-body connection. Um, more powerful than I ever really realized. Um, I started the slide decks with those to really help show that it's powerful, more than I'd ever thought in, in the research that I've seen. Um, the power of a po positive thought versus the power of a negative thought go hand in hand. They work together. They, is it the only pathway? No. But when you have a positive thought, when you're working towards things, you're in a better place, you feel better, a little more energy level comes up, the same thing happens. And that translates not only from overall sense of well-being, but it translates all the way down to our individual selves. They know it as well as we know it. It's, it's kind of weird, but, it, but it's true. Um, and when the body starts feeling that way, the pain start to start to subside a little bit more. So maybe it's only 2% of it, maybe it's 20% of it, maybe it's 50% of the situation. I've seen people, heck, it's been 100% of the situation. They took their stress situation out together and their pain went away altogether. Not only metaphorically, but also realistically. So um, great to be able to have that on board and supporting the body and doing what it needs to do. Because again, if we're wanting to balance this out, we have to approach it differently. So, you know, what's the rule of thumb? And I normally don't like to read my slide decks, but whatever you were doing that got you sick, don't do it anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, and sometimes you don't know, but if you feel that there was something that contributed to it, um, it needs to stop. Because now all we're doing is gonna be consistently irritating that situation or that organ or our body, and we don't wanna do that, we need to stop that. And it needs to change the way we live, you know? Change your lifestyle, it will change your life. I call it the, the must-do list. Um, just a good idea to, to, you know, check yourself, see where, see where this at is in, in your lifestyle. Um, it helps to give me a reminder, as well as kind of a, uh, a map and a direction as to where I'm going and what I'm doing and which way we're gonna go. So. The do not list, of course, that's kind of self-explanatory. Um, we can take that on, we can not take that on, but we know that, you know, one thing by itself, yeah, you're right, it may not um, have all that of an effect, but all together, you put all those things in 
in one boat, well, and that's where it kind of gets sticky. So, you know, I've had people that oh, I smoked all my life, my grandfather smoked all his life, and yada, yada, yada. Well, maybe he smoked all his life, but he also worked on the farm every day, and he ate naturally or something. I, I don't know, but you put these things together, and uh, it, it makes a recipe for ill health, and that's what we're trying to avoid here, is uh, keeping our body, giving it the ability to do all the things that it needs, and when we do that, we know we'll be healthy. When we talk about detoxification, we kind of hear about it a lot. Um, you know, I need to detox. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, I mean, mostly around, uh, let's say, substance abuse of some sort, your body needs to detox. Well, no different from um, all the the waste products that, that, and chemicals and impurities, all these things need to be removed from the body. How does that happen? Um, you know, again, we have 70, you know, this slide, 100 trillion cells, and all those are needing to detox. What can we do with that? Um, and it's just as important as nutrition. So um, I, I bring these slides in to, to understand that what we take in we must also remove out. And our body does that naturally, and we can help it along. Whether that's why um, exercise does that for our lymphatic system, heating up our body with, with exercise or dry saunas um, helps to detox out the skin. Um, we breathe it out through our, through our, our, uh, our lungs. Our liver naturally does it. Our kidneys do it for our skin, our blood, our bowels. All these things work together. And if you just had one working well, but the other's not, there's a problem. How do all these work together? Again, depending upon our lifestyle. Everything affects those things. So uh, when, we, when we bring those, those forms of healing together, now we're bringing everything to the, to the party, per se. Now we're bringing the, the good food, the good air, the exercise, and all these things now happen naturally. Our responsibility as stewards of our bodies is simply to bring it there. Um, here are some things that really target detoxification real specifically. Um, some do them all, some just do a few of them. Um, see which one resonates well with you, and I would recommend that you do it at least you know, once every every three months, depending on what your diet and lifestyle is. You eat well belt, well balanced meals and you get lots of exercise and then uh, lots of fiber, then okay, maybe just do some green juicing, some carrot juicing. If you're feeling like you're down and out and you really need some help, then maybe a, you know, the parasite and the coffee enemas and, and those types of things, but it's, it's really individual. <coughs> you can take it a, 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 a another level higher. You can go to the infrared saunas. Um, all these things are forms of what comes in and what comes out. We are not only physical beings, but we're, we're emotional beings, and again, those things come in, they're processed, they need to be removed. And if any of that work needs to happen, um, it puts our body in, in a much more successful situation. Um, and emotional stress, again, I come back to that, powerful. Um, think of the weight that we've ever gone through in our lives of, that have been emotional and how heavy that's ever felt and if we really put down that burden or we really process that or come to a, a resolution with something, wow, you could be a little overweight and maybe you're not eating right what a big game changer that is. And it can set you on the course for fixing other things. Um, now we get into a key area that I want to get target, and that's really more specific to the poly MK. Um, metabolism is, is key. Without it, without the energy, what do we have? You can have, you can have your DNA. But with, if the DNA doesn't have any power in it, doesn't have any energy in it, what's that DNA going to do? A whole lot of nothing. Uh, Dr. Garnett had given me an example where he, you know, said, "Hey, take a take a seed of anything. Take a seed of that tree over there and and, and take it and set it on your counter. What's going to happen to it? Nothing. It's going to sit there, right? But it has all the DNA to be that oak tree. Okay. Take that same seed, take it outside, put it in the dirt, get some sunshine on it, water water it." take care of it, what's going to happen? It's going to grow. Did it just do that magically? All of a sudden, you created the, the positive environment for that. And that cell, that seed sprouted and grew. And if you maintain it and you take care of it, then look what happens. The body becomes 
available to now move forward. It can grow in the proper environment. If not, it can grow in a, in a toxic environment, let's say, or a less um, healthy environment. And what's going to happen? It may be stunted growth tree. Uh, you can see the analogy of what I'm trying to get to. Well, guess what? The normal cell and the cancer cell, no different. The environment. The normal cell can become the cancer cell with the bad environment. And what can we do with the cancer cell? Well, let's see what the body will do with it. So we talk about metabolism, and it really targets, this is the process. It's called the Krebs cycle. It's called uh, ATP. It's how our cells develop energy. And it's a really key difference as to what abnormal cells do. So this is the process at the mitochondria to create energy for all our cells. Each cell does it. It needs to do it. And lipoic acid and thymine are what are involved for this energy. They're part of that process. There's other things as well, but they are a key part that helps to um, support and create this ATP energy so that it can generate energy in our cells. Okay, and what does that energy do? Well, when that energy is created, our cells can now go and do what they need to do. Skin cell, liver cell, um, stomach cell, brain cell, nerve cell, all the cells, all those 70 trillion cells of our bodies now can go and become those cells because the differentiated cell requires a whole lot more energy. The cancer cell, the abnormal cell by definition, does not. It doesn't use this process. It uses a simple sugar process to break it down because it doesn't need to go and do any work. That's not what it's designed to. It's designed to simply replicate like our earlier cells were when they didn't need a lot of energy. But when they do need to be go and become and do some work, they need a whole lot more. And this process is known as ATP. So in glycolysis, this is where you can see glucose gets turned into pyruvate. Well, in a cancer cell, that doesn't happen. It just simply uses the glucase, the glucose, and isn't necessary because it doesn't have the ATP process. It simply has, or doesn't have the Krebs cycle. It simply has, which can generate 38 units of ATP versus the cancer cell version and anaerobic versus aerobic. It doesn't need oxygen. That's what that means. It only needs two. I ran across this article oh, a few years back. It was in Newsweek. And it was interesting to, to read this as if it was some profound new bit of information that, that what actually triggers the main process in our cells is this, these little things inside them that are called the mitochondria. Um, and not only do they control apoptosis, but they also control um, how our cells are working. They are the energy, the energy factors of our cells. And without them, then our cells don't work and without energy nothing's going to work so and they're also the same ones that when those shut off and turn down they're the process of when our cells say okay time for me to shut off and go away something that a cancer cell doesn't have a cancer cell doesn't know how to die it forgot how to die and one of the differentiated factors is the fact that the mitochondria in a cancer cell are totally different they don't work the same way so this has led to what's called the mitochondrial theory of aging and disease, in which these are more powerful factors than anybody ever imagined. This ability to create, maintain, and support energy is what is key for our cells to do all everything they need to do. So, and they all work together from um, how antioxidants play a role in there, how the DNA works together, um, diet and exercise help to factor these by creating more energy, by using up, um, by becoming more active in our cells, our bodies are healthier. And what does that can lead to? That can now lead to various therapies based upon the metabolic support of our cells. And we realize that by targeting that, now all of a sudden our bodies now have an ability to be more effective. And you combine those with things like coenzyme Q10, D-ribose, L-carnitine, potassium, all these various things work together to create that cellular energy. And if we do that, we can have an astounding effect on our body. Lipoic acid palladium complex. The, the key ingredient is in polyam V8. That's a picture of what the structure actually looks like. Um, you have two legs of alpha lipoic acid with one leg of thymine around the core of the mineral palladium. They're bound together. 
And now, wherever alpha lipoic acid goes, thymine goes. And wherever thymine goes, alpha lipoic acid goes. They work well together. So what Dr. Garnett was able to create was the complex that carries these two around together all the time. Whereas before, if you had alpha lipoic acid there and you didn't have thymine, well, it still did its job. It just didn't do it as effectively. And if you had thymine there but not alpha lipoic acid, yeah, it worked, but didn't do its job as effectively. Now, one goes, the other goes, and the synergy is created. Also in the product are other minerals, vitamins, and amino acids. So the minerals, and that's where you get the MDA for poly-MDA. The other minerals are molybdenum, rhodium, and lithium, and vitamins B1, B2, B12, and the amino acids, N-acetylcysteine, and formalmethionine. What are they there for? All there to support and promote cellular energy production. So there's one thing that I want you to walk away from and really target and remember on is this metabolic factor, the metabolism of our cells, that we keep that energy up and our cells operate um, healthier as well as better. Uh, there's a picture of Dr. Merrill Garnett in his book about first pulse. Uh, and he talks about first pulse. Uh, you could probably understand why, because first pulse means the cell's first pulse, whereas it maintains its, without that energy, the cell isn't alive. So, and if you maintain it properly, then the cell operates properly. If something happens with that energy source, then there's gonna be a problem in the cell. Um, think about it with electricity. If you have the right amount of electricity to your, to your phone or your computer or your household, things work properly. If that energy cycle isn't proper, what's gonna happen? damage some of the equipment or not work at all or work sporadically um, and you can see how similarly this is whether it's our cells or anything electrical that works in the world. Um, Dr. Garnett again came up with his motto and his belief is do no harm and how can we use this metabolic process if it is such a key factor in apoptosis can we target that you know how do we get the expression of our DNA to operate more effectively well, if we could give it more energy, if we could support that metabolic factor, could we have an impact on the proper health of ourselves? And the answer was yes. You know, we talked about a little bit earlier on what, again, what, why is it so unique? What's so different about that? And it's this bonding process. So imagine there were three of you in a room and three people working independently of themselves. You know, they can get some work done and that's good and they can move some things individually. But together, if those three were bound together, could they do more? And the answer is yes. And that's what lipoic acid palladium complex is. They are bound together, and this now has an ability because of alpha lipoic acid on one side and thymine on the other. Now you got one alpha lipoic acid quenching and absorbing energy, and you have thymine on the other side that's now supporting energy so you can mimic the electron transport chain or the energy pathway of our cells which now you're picking up this energy that would normally be doing damage and now you're giving it to the cell so it can be more healthy a lot of times people ask the question well why, why can't i just take those things individually and and have the same effect well because your body is going to use things individually as well where all the, the B1 goes, where all the alpha lipoic acid goes, you don't know. But lipoic acid palladium complex will go, being water and fat soluble, travel to all cells of the body and have the ability to now support all the cells no matter where they are. So does it, does, is it an immune booster? Well, indirectly yes, because it's supporting the energy production of your immune cells. Is it a nerve system protector? Well, of course it is, it has alpha lipoic acid in it. Could it support the energy production of them as well? Of course it can. And you can see why now it, it becomes universal for the body's support. All our cell support now have this um, ability to quench free radicals as well as donate those back to our cells. So again, that bottom uh, statement, it, it's a very effective energy transfer molecule. And I'll show you an example of that here shortly. This is an ORAC test. What that means is it's uh, compound's ability to absorb free radicals or um, oxidation, oxidative stress, or um, and how it fares. So if you use vitamin E, which we know is a good antioxidant, compared to vitamin A, vitamin C, melatonin, 
Well, and lipoic acid, the universal one. Some of those are water soluble, some of those are fat soluble. Lipoic acid is unique because it's water and fat soluble. Well, guess what? You take poly and VA and you complex it together, and guess what? You make it four times more effective than lipoic acid by itself. Four times, it's like, soup, it's like alpha lipoic acid on steroids. Now you have a, 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 a large energy transfer molecule that can do it much more effectively, and that's what gives poly and VA its uniqueness. How does it work? Well, if we're looking at an abnormal cell and you enter poly and VA inside that cell, what's it going to do? It's going to absorb free radicals and try and target the DNA. But prior to that, it's also going to try and shuttle this energy because that's what it's trying to do. That's what thymine does, is generate energy at the mitochondria. But these cancer cells are like, I don't need that. I work off anaerobic respiration. I don't use aerobic respiration. What do I want this for? Well, and we know it does that because if you give regular lipoic acid with it, it will block the effect of the lipoic acid palladium complex. What's it going to do? By shuttling that energy, you're going to be creating oxygen radicals down the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. Okay, what's the big deal inside a cancer cell? Well, if you generate oxygen radicals inside a cancer cell, it's going to trigger what's known as apoptosis, the release of cytochrome C, turns on caspase, which is the normal way that our cells turn off. That's the process, like I referred to earlier in the other slide, where the mitochondria control when the cells live and when the cells die. If they stop producing energy, the cell's going to die. If they continue to do it, the cell will live to a certain degree. So, but a cancer cell doesn't deal well with oxygen inside the cell because they're anaerobic versus your normal cells are aerobic, meaning they require oxygen to help produce this ATP and this energy. And if you start giving it this energy and start giving it this oxygen, what's going to happen? The cell's going to turn off. Now, if you take a healthy cell, what's going to happen? Same process. LAPD is in the system, it's donating energy, it's upregulating O2. The mitochondria in this case are saying, thank you very much. Wow, I have a mechanism that can help control and support and create oxygen and energy? Heck yeah, that's what I got to do to take care of my DNA, to take care of my RNA, to take care of all the other factors that this cell has to do to do its work. Now I stabilize that chain, I protect from any type of, of, of radicals, and now we have a healthy and energized cell. That's a win-win. I mean, flat out, you take that basic approach and you put that into these other um, natural products as well as any other integrative type uh, approaches to helping and supporting the cell, now you have a win-win mechanism. On that slide deck as well, it talks about ischemic reperfusion radicals. And what that means is that it quenches those. Um, Dr. Antonio, which had done a lot of the work for ischemia, and that's like in a stroke situation, ischemia, when you cut off blood flow to cells, what happens? Well, these reperfusion radicals get generated and they actually go out and do a lot of damage. Well, what he found out, not surprisingly, is that the lipoic acid palladium complex will quench those, will put out their fire and stop them from doing damage. So, huge impact on, on these ischemic cells. That, and that happens sometimes when, when our bodies don't even know it. So it makes a great and ideal um, agent for um, prophylactic use for anyone that's, that might be predisposed to um, ischemia type situations. It's history. You know, animal studies, human studies, um, lipoic acid palladium complex and poly have been used for years. Very safe, very effective, and showing very targeted, targeted support in, in many of these situations. So where oxygen, where energy support is needed, uh, poly MV is, is a very unique complex that can um, target those pathways and then give the, the patients and the doctors a unique opportunity to uh, work together for a better solution. You know, this slide deck reminds me of the fact of of, of what we're kind of up against. Um, you know, why in the world would you have a, a, a six billion dollar drug um, who really doesn't even um, do anything for for overall survival? What was the point? All the time all the effort, um, and it was allowed to stand. Why? 
why would this be able to, to be done when it isn't showing um, any long-term benefit, but yet you know, it makes the question why the pharmaceutical industry is doing what the pharmaceutical industry is doing. They're, they're, they, they can't patent vitamin C. They can't patent vitamin B. Um, and so how would they, why would they spend the money to look at how effective those things might be against um, or in support of um, anyone with a certain type of degenerative disease? It doesn't because they then couldn't turn around and go sell it. And I understand that <clears throat> from a business model. That makes sense. Why would you invest in something that you can't get a return on your investment? At the same time, it's the responsibility of the federal government to look to the welfare and the benefit of the people. So um, not just to approve of something just because or for other various reasons. There's a good picture of, of the poly MBA both orally and intravenously um, and it can be used in both manners and in combinations and works well with um, other things. I put up CoQ10 very specifically. Um, coenzyme Q10 helps to stabilize and support that mitochondrial chain um, and when those two are used together uh, we, it's, it's a much more increased and beneficial effect to the energy of the mitochondria into our cells. Um, other antioxidants work well with it. Some of the other ones are like the fish oils, the, the, the vitamin E's, vitamin D's, um, as well as other complementary therapies. This is a quote from uh, Dr. James Forsyth, who's an integrative oncologist in Reno, Nevada, um, one of the pioneers in his field, as well as in the outcome-based studies for his cancer patients. That he was a traditional oncologist and then he realized that he wasn't getting anywhere and that he could really help out his patients even more so by helping with an integrative approach. So he's really pioneered a lot of the, the IPTs and the poly MP therapies to help quality of life, to help uh, various conditions so that um, the patient is what comes first, not the uh, not just the survivability. If the outcome and the quality of life of the patient isn't um, isn't improved, then what as a doctor has the doctor done? And so, uh, an honor and a unique man to, to help out the people that he does. He cares about his patients and he's, and he's there with them every step of the way. So, I support him and, and really believe in his, his approach and we hope that others will as well. Um, some of the things where he's seen his protocols and the, uh, the poly and MBA work together um, because again, these, these are the things that don't get discussed. Um, it's just, well, did the cancer get, 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 did you get rid of the cancer? Did it grow? Did it not grow? Well, but in the meantime, um, a lot of people have heard of, you know, they call it chemo brain. It's, they're in a fog. So what was the point? Um, you know, the neuropathies, the damage to the other organs, um, the side effects of, of, of many of these chemo and radiotherapies are huge, and those are never even addressed. It's simply cancer and, and kill it. Cancer and kill it. Everything else, yeah, it's secondary because the cancer is going to kill you anyway, so if you die five years later because of a heart problem, yeah, okay, and you go down as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a death to heart disease, but at the same time, what if you could do both? It doesn't have to be an either-or situation. You can be able to possibly use low-dose chemotherapy or insulin potentiated therapy with chemotherapy and then use integrative approaches uh, like poly MV8 to help support the body. That's what they're designed to do. Take the resveratrol, take the fish oils, take all these other things that are going to support your cells and your, your other ones from the damaging effects of, of some of these other therapies. Um, we believe in uh, a basic patient bill of rights as Dr. Forsyth puts it. Um, when you put this recipe together, he has had more success in the last um, six, seven years now than he ever has before with his cancer patients. Why? Because he's now approaching it in a whole different way. He's not just doing the chemotherapy, radiation, and surgeries and saying that's all he can offer. He can understand that this is a bigger battle and a bigger uh, approach than what he was taught and what he was told. And he's trying to share that with other people as well to let them know and give them hope that there are things out there and that they can they can try them. Again, we're all looking for answers at a certain level, and we talked about this. So I'm just kind of bringing it back now, full circle. How do we target this thing from not only cancer but degenerative diseases? We really have to look at it holistically. Um, it's you know, I mean, 
Hippocrates said it better than I could do it. it. It is more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of a disease the person has. And he's trying to remind the doctors of, of what they're doing and why. And if you can, if they can bring to the to their patient this this, this approach, then the patient is better off. Um, and now this is where science and modern medicine can really come full circle because we have such a better understanding of how hormones, how inflammation, how the immune system, all these connections work together and we can now start to pull out some of these things like the toxicity, increase the nutritional value, work on the mind-body, lower the oxidative stress, lower the inflammation, make sure the hormones are in the right ways, check the immune system. And when you do that, now all of a sudden, lo and behold, wow, you have better health and well-being for not only their patients, but for people in the world. So, a big philosophy that, that, that my father had instilled in myself and in, in, in doing what we're doing in, in the poly and gain in the business is the fact that you know, information is, should be free and that we all need to make those decisions for ourselves. And so we really believe that information is, is, is the force of change and we hope that by educating you and by providing you this information, um, it helps to maybe trigger something in, in your situation or someone else there for your patients um, that you might find. Um, you know, there is no silver bullet, there is no one answer, but there definitely is something and that we can find that when we work at it collectively and we can work at it together. So I appreciate your time and listening to this. I hope it was educational and, and uh, informational and, and positive for you. Please. You know, feel free to give me any feedback that you like. If there's something more that you want to know about, I'm happy to, to discuss that. You can call the office and or speak with one of the consultants and they can get in touch with me and love to share any more information and or learn from you as well. So thank you again and have a wonderful day.